I have been, I'm here to take you to the dark side. No more theorems, though we'll use that term sometimes. We have to be really careful saying the word theorem in this building. Uh, okay, so these lectures will be about higher symmetry in particle physics. So some applications towards the subject of phenomenology. Though uh, I am not a bread and butter phenomenologist, so it'll have my own take. So our goal, of course, is to understand uh, symmetry, higher symmetry in problems relevant to Fino. Um, and one thing to say to get started is that if you're going to do this, you really need to think about symmetry breaking. Uh, most of the rest of these talks uh, that, that other speakers will give will be about the situation where you have an exact symmetry, which is a good starting point. But if you think about applications of symmetry in particle physics, we need to understand symmetry breaking. Why is that? Well, in particle physics, symmetry are, is usually an accident. That's kind of the, the modern way that uh, most symmetries are viewed in the particle physics community. They're an accident of a particular effective field theory, a particular low energy truncation. And actually, um, when we take quantum gravity into account, we even have something like arguments that black hole physics perhaps implies that all symmetries are broken in the UV. <laughs> I'll put a big question mark here. Actually, I, I, I write this on the board um, specifically to highlight it as an important open problem um, to understand to what extent uh, this is rigorous. We sort of have very clean arguments for the case of, say, a U1 standard symmetry. Um, but if you start talking about generalized symmetries, higher symmetries, discrete symmetries, even fancier notions of symmetry, then there's a big question mark here. But we'll take this as a hint that if you want to do phenomenology, you should think about patterns of symmetry breaking. Um, so we'll start there. OK, so ordinary symmetry. Uh, this we understand. Breaking uh, is by charged local operators. So let me write sort of the silliest toy model on the board just to get us all on the same page. So we could have a Lagrangian, which is some scalar field. Uh, maybe there's some potential so some z2 invariant so th this part has some exact z2 invariance and if you want to so uh, you could start your life saying okay I have a I have a to first approximation I have a good z2 symmetry I study the problem uh, everything I can get out of this Z2 symmetry. And then I start to try to understand the leading symmetry violating effects. And in this kind of uh, effective field theory, when we're talking about an ordinary symmetry, this is a Z2 ordinary symmetry, we know what we're supposed to do. We'd write down uh, the uh, leading relevant symmetry violating operator that we cannot remove by a field redefinition. So we'd write, say, lambda phi cubed. This is the violating operator. And we try to understand the physics for small lambda, small but not zero. Okay? If lambda is enormous, then there's no even approximate sense in which we have this symmetry. But if lambda is small, we approximately have this symmetry. So you would make a, a plot. This is all very standard, but uh, you know maybe you'd make a plot of the potential. And it would look 
not quite symmetric. There would be some energy, energy difference between, say, these two vacua. And so the most relevant symmetry violating operator is controlling the physics here. So the symmetry is a good organizing principle, and we understand very cleanly symmetry breaking mechanisms for ordinary symmetry in effective field theory. OK, so that's all well and good. Uh, yes? Is there a reason why you wrote the spy cube and not phi? Because uh, you can remove that one by a shift of phi. So how phi seems more fundamental, at least if you're thinking about the physical point? Well, you can, you can just shift the, the definition. I would, yeah, I understand. We could debate that. But I don't want to spend any more time on this example. Um, OK, so uh, we want to sort of develop what is the picture of this as close as we can. Uh, for higher symmetry. So if we start talking about one form symmetry, later we'll talk about non-invertible symmetry, higher group symmetry. What are the symmetry breaking mechanisms? And what does that teach us about various effective field theories? So that's kind of the, the main theme that we should have in mind. Let's see. Hmm. OK. There are more boards. All three. But how do I get them back? There is this gadget. Oh, yeah, that will be embarrassing to use. OK. Uh, <laughs> I won't be able to do it, and then it will be embarrassing. OK. Uh, I'll have to call on you to help me. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. I can do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. One form symmetry. Let's start there. So I'm sure you've had wonderful lectures. Uh, by Thomas about one form symmetry and some introduction to higher group symmetry. I'll probably, for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, have some overlap with him. So kind of bringing to the front the things that we'll need. And then we'll diverge. So the new effect, which no doubt you heard about, is that all local operators are neutral. So if you have a one form symmetry in a low energy effective action, you just cannot violate it by adding any local operator deformation to the action. It's impossible because the one form symmetry does not act on any local operators. There is no most relevant charged operator. The same method will not work. Make it a little bit more concrete. So for instance, in Maxwell theory, which no doubt was an example uh, on the board before, you have these two one-form symmetries. Hopefully, Thomas used this notation. Was this notation used? Yeah. yeah. OK, we have these two one-form symmetries, the electric and uh, magnetic one-form symmetries. So we could start writing the Lagrangian, something like this. But then maybe we're more ambitious. We say this is our infrared effective action, and we write some leading interaction, some light by light scattering term, like the Euler Heisenberg term. So maybe some 1 over lambda to the fourth. And then we write f mu nu, f mu nu squared, for instance. Okay. Does that violate any symmetry? Well, I told you because of this, it will not violate any symmetry. But how do you see that explicitly? Um, well, in this effective field theory, F is still the derivative of A. And so that means we still have the Bianchi identity. So that tells us we have which symmetry still? Louder. Magnetic. Yeah, the chorus. Magnetic, yeah. And we have this one still. OK. Right? Yeah, we're in the field theory approximation. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, uh, and then we also have the electric one. So the electric one, we have to actually look at the equation of motion. 
Right? The equation of motion was what gave us the electric one before, so it's what will have a chance to give us the electric one now. And so what is the equation of motion? Uh, divergence of f. That was before you had the Euler-Heisenberg term. Now you have the Euler-Heisenberg term, and so you get something like 1 over uh, lambda to the fourth. I'll just write f squared to save myself a bit of time times f mu nu. This is 0. And so if you just call this gadget j mu nu, it's still conserved. So you see that what happened is that the electric current the electric one-form symmetry current got modified, but there's still a current. And this theory is really still a theory of two conserved currents. Yeah. yeah. If you think about the lattice model, uh, this statement uh, kind of seems tricky. Uh, because in a lattice model, you may have an operator which do the one-form symmetry transformation. Then, then you can imagine you can have a local lattice operator which do not commute with this uh, one form symmetry transformation. Yeah. And then you can seems you can always uh, break this, one this form is, symmetry yeah. by, by this local operator. We have to be we have to be careful on the uh, comparing the lattice and the continuum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because the the lattice um, as from the view as viewed from the continuum, the lattice has more degrees of freedom. Right? The lattice has the monopoles dynamical. The lattice has so um, so often um, but uh, uh, you know we're kind of going towards that because I'm going to think about how to break oh, these symmetries. Okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. monopoles monopoles are local operators. So. Monopoles are not local operators in uh, in three plus one dimensions. I mean, those ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, does this change in the current in general uh, give you like a change also in the charge of operators? Does it change who's charged? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it changes their charges a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's everything, but it's very computable. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a composite. So is it obvious that there is some normalization, renormalization scheme such that this is still well defined and conserved? Um, yes, I think so, but I am not going to show you that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Um, so we keep going. So um, all right now. <laughs> okay, maybe I should just postpone this hook. If, if anybody doesn't like what I'm saying, you can use this hook to pull me off the stage. <laughs> okay, so now I think probably Thomas told you uh, what you need to actually break the symmetry. So symmetry breaking requires new charged particles. That's how we would say it in a particle physics language. So if we have dynamical electric charges, then d star f will not be 0. And this u1 e will be broken. And similarly, if we have dynamical magnetic charges, then they will not globally exist in A. Such that this equation is true. There will not be a one form A obeying that. And then, of course, that means that the magnetic one form symmetry is broken. So that's how uh, symmetry breaking works. Since we're talking about applications to phenomenology, I'd like to just mention a little comment, which is that you might ask, uh, what does particle physics or quantum gravity have to say about the scale of breaking? Is there any kind of statement there? It's actually rather interesting. Um, the scale of breaking
All right, I told you that quantum gravity says something, maybe, like all these symmetries have to be broken eventually. Um, does it ever say a sharper statement? That's a, the subject of much research these days, though not phrased exactly in this language. So for instance, if U1, one electric symmetry is broken by order one at the Planck scale, this is the same statement as the weak gravity conjecture. Which is quite a hot topic these days. So I'm not going to tell you very much about that, but I just wanted to, to mention that, that uh, coming from kind of a, a particle physics or phenomotivated point of view, you might even have a bias about how strongly these things should be broken. You might think that by the time you reach the Planck scale, there shouldn't even be any approximate symmetries. So at the quantum gravity level, all symmetries are broken or we can gauge or? Yeah, a gauge symmetry is no symmetry at all, so. Wait, sorry, isn't uh, U1E broken like at way lower scales than that? Because we have electrons. Um, yes, but it would still be, uh, but well, this will take me a, a lot of time to explain, but that if, if you look at sort of how badly it's broken by one charged particle, it's really not badly broken until you reach the Landau pole. Right? It's still a very small violation of the, of the symmetry. Sorry, now that you said this, can you say it's order one, like what happens to the inversion? Well, I mean, this is just equivalent. This is just a way of, this is like an exact equivalence between the weak gravity conjecture um, and the... But now I can start imagining of ways of destroying this quantum Well, you have to ask whether that, those ways can be embedded in some quantum gravity theory. That, that's what makes it hard. Yeah, maybe a stupid question. What is the expansion parameter when you are talking about this order? Yeah, uh, thanks. So a more, a more sharp way of saying it is maybe that the weak gravity conjecture uh, means that there is not a family of models labeled by some parameter such that as you tune this parameter, the symmetry gets parametrically good near the Planck scale. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll get the hang of it eventually. After. Um, okay. So. So that's what's going on with one form symmetry. Now the main uh, subject for the today's rest of my two lectures today is the analog of this for higher group symmetry. And something that I'll dangerously call the emergence theorem. But again, I'm in hollowed ground for that. Uh, OK. so. I think you know a bit about higher groups, so we'll be in sort of the simplest scenario. We'll have a U1, 1, 1 form symmetry. We'll have some G0 form symmetry, um, but uh, un unlike uh, Max for right now, I'm going to restrict myself um, to some connected Lie group, so e.g. SUN, something very familiar. And these can form a higher group. In this case, you would call it, um, confusingly, a two group, even though the top dimension of the symmetry is one. And there's a structure constant of this uh, symmetry, which is kappa, which is an integer. Okay. Now, there are a variety of ways to characterize uh, the way in which these two symmetries mix with that structure constant. 
Some of them you saw. I bet some of them you didn't, though. So one is by background fields. Okay. Background fields, so the U11 form symmetry would have a friend, which is a two form, B2. This symmetry would have some gauge field, A1. And we'd have an unusual gauge transformation rule, kind of Green Schwartz formula, which is that B2 changes to B2 plus D of capital lambda 1. This was the standard parameter. And then a kind of funny term, kappa over 4 pi, trace lambda 0 d a 1. This is the zero form parameter. So that's one way. OK, now I'll do this very gently. Maybe not. The first uh, is a non-commutative operation. <laughs> OK. But now how do I get access to the other one? <laughs> you can use the to push this one up, and then the other one down. It's almost as bad as Germany, where you have that sponge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. I'll be a pro by the end. Okay. Okay, so that's one way. Um, now, uh, especially if you wanted to understand what the version of this was for discrete symmetry, you might wish to characterize it by symmetry defects. Okay, so we'll have co-dimension one defects from G0, and we'll have co-dimension two defects from this U11. And for this bullet, you can uh, work in the, uh, in the discrete world as well. It will work nicely. Um, so let's see if I can draw what you would try to draw here. So I guess this one is supposed to be blocking this one, so you can't see that. And then I need one more. So let's see, this will be the symmetry defect for G. Uh, this will be the one for, say, H. These are some group elements. And then there'll be another one, which can be in brown, uh, which is, let's see, so this would go out, kind of the other axis here. And it, you know, they cut through here. And then it joins up back there. And this one could be k. So that's just three intersecting planes. And there's some magic point in the center of it. Okay. So the first thing is that this triple intersection point is a generic phenomenon in 2 plus 1d and above. So there's nothing tuned about this picture. And it is characterized 
by a group cohomology class. Um, so the group cohomology class will live in H3 of G0, the zero form, and temporarily I'll write a general one form symmetry, A1. And so uh, if this thing, uh, and you should think that kappa, what I called kappa, is somebody in there. Okay. And what does this thing mean? Well, it means that if that kappa is non-zero, then coming out of this triple intersection point is some one form symmetry defect A. That's what this tells you. So the, this group cohomology class is a widget which can eat three zero form defects and spit out a one form defect. So that's, that's the, uh, the picture of what two group symmetry is in terms of, in, in terms of the symmetry defects. Okay, maybe we'll go over here for a little while. Now, for a simple Lie group, so that picture works even if everything is discrete. But coming back to this uh, G0 s simple case, so maybe SUN or, a here, a is to be the little a yeah. is an element, so little a is some element in the one form symmetry. That's something up again. For D, A should be a lot. <coughs> it should be correlation Yeah. So this is a picture in three, this picture is geometrically accurate in three dimensions. Where these are surfaces, this is a point, and this is a line. So these are symmetry defects of a one form symmetry. Yes, these are all the symmetry defects. Yes, that's right. OK, now, now in this case, um, which is the case that we're, we're basically interested in, h3 of g0 with coefficients in u1, this is just z. And again, this is where I said that kappa was eventually. This is the same group uh, and the same cohomology definition that characterizes Chern-Simons terms. So it's that same quantization of Chern-Simons terms that's giving you this quantization of kappa. OK, so that's, okay, so that's the second way to think about two-group symmetry. Uh, and there's a third way, a third way, which is current algebra, especially if you're studying all these continuous symmetries. You could say, don't talk to me about symmetry defects and background fields. We just have some currents. They have some correlation functions. What are you talking about in terms of that information? That's kind of the most basic way, actually. So we have some current j mu nu, which is for our u1 one form symmetry. And let's say j nu with some adjoint index a for, say, sun or whatever Lie group you might be talking about. Now you can consider the following operator product. Consider the divergence of j mu a at x and let it collide with j nu b at y. Then the OPE we want to study is the channel where this, I'll even put the two pi's for you, reproduces I'm going to be in four space-time dimensions for this equation. But I could put a d if we wanted. This reproduces the one form symmetry current. So starting from this OPE, you can integrate various sides and derive Ward identities on correlation functions with the currents inserted. Now, a comment here. So many of you might be wondering, what the heck? You've got the divergence of the current. Isn't this supposed to be 0? Right? Well, having a symmetry 
means that the current is conserved at separated points in correlation functions. Right? So indeed, the divergence of this current must be zero as an operator. In any, that means all correlation functions where this point x is distinct from any other point in the correlator must be zero. And this identity that I have written is of that form because I here have a delta function. Right? So the divergence has an interesting contact term when it touches another current. This is not really determined. Uh, this is like current J, J nu is also contained in its own P. Um, yeah, current J is also contained. Sorry, I should, I should say this is in. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, the, it's, the, it's the channel where you produce the one form current. That's, that's uninteresting. Why is it on one feet? Uh, was, was there a question? Uh, uh, from here, I couldn't see the indices. Uh, oh, uh, it's, it's fine, it's fine. OK. OK, yeah. Um, <coughs> good. OK. OK. I yeah. need to explain why there are two currents there and in the second <coughs> way thinking about that, there are three um, uh, defects. Um, do you want me to explain that? Um, I don't really want to explain it. Um, how about, it will take a while. Let's talk about it afterwards. So you need three defects to produce the end point of the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. More questions yeah, that I might refuse to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the definition of the product that you're tracing up the adjunct vertices, right? Uh, well, I'm saying that it follows from this this kind of uh, algebra. That I mean, this is if you like, this is a definition of of two group global symmetry. That it's it's a delta function or the Cartan matrix in the adjoint, right? I mean, I think the non-trivial thing is that all three of these points of view are the same. Right? That these are three different viewpoints on the same underlying uh, symmetry structure. <coughs> yeah. The fact that the level is quantized, can one see it in this current algebra? Thing? The current algebra, it's pretty, str it's pretty fast to go from the current algebra to that formula, right? Because um, because the you know variation with respect to background fields can produce the correlators directly, so it's very fast to go from this to this. And then the simplest way to quantize to see the quantization of the level is um, is to show that this formula is actually only consistent if if kappa is quantized. Okay, all right, great. So. Um, Maybe one other comment before we start breaking this symmetry um, is that uh, all of these uh, viewpoints tell you that um, while, while two-group symmetry is an interesting current algebra, it's not a modification of the equal time charge algebra. So it's not like the commutator of the zero-form symmetries produces now a one-form symmetry. It's not that. Right? All these pictures, they can't be drawn at equal time. And so it's, it, it's a interesting current algebra, but it's not a modification of the equal time charge action. The non-invertible symmetry, which we'll discuss tomorrow, is. Okay. Okay, so now um, I began with the slogan that if you want to do particle physics, once you have a fancy symmetry, you should try to break it. So we're going to do that now. We're going to break this two-group symmetry. And I'd like to discuss something that I'll call the emergence theorem, uh, which was first written down in a paper by myself, Ken Intrilligator, and Thomas Dumitrescu. So two groups, what we're discussing here, are a higher analog of group extensions. So if you wanted to think a little bit algebraically about what we have written, you would have this zero form symmetry G0. You have this one form symmetry uh, U1, and then sitting in the middle is something we've called boldface G. 
This is the two group. Now this is an extension, uh, it's a generalization of a group extension because the groups don't have the same form degree. You could make it sharp if you thought about the classifying spaces. Right, so I'm talking about an extension of the classifying space of this by this. Kind of, I'm telling you what the Postnikov tower is, if you know that language. Now, just like in the case of group extensions, there's something fundamental that you should recognize about such a diagram. So this is a subgroup. This is the quotient. And if the extension is not trivial, then the quotient is not a subgroup. Sounds very fancy. We have all these other definitions, so we could try to say what I mean by that more explicitly in terms of these other definitions. One good way is with that current algebra. So as we look at that OPE, well, the OPE tells us that if kappa is non-zero, then something like J With J, the zero form with the zero form contains the one form. And it also follows from that formula that the right-hand side is conserved, that that's a conserved current. So you can think of this kind of like any other uh, algebra with that property. It's like saying, um, you know, if what we're supposed to take away from this is that if you have the zero form symmetry, and you have a non trivial two group, you necessarily have the one form symmetry. That's what you're supposed to get from this. Very simple uh, observation. It's kind of like saying in SU2, once you have J plus and J minus, J3 comes for free. Any questions about that? We're going to milk this observation for all it's worth now. This is the definition of like two group current algebra, if you like. One, the kappa, I mean, it's allowed for kappa to be zero. Then the zero form symmetry and the one form symmetry just live their separate lives and they don't talk to each other. So the statement is that if I have the two group you will find the one form current term ah. with a quantized coefficient. And then I would say two groups. Yeah, exactly. So this is how you would discover it. If, if all you have is your abstract QFT with some current operators, you just start investigating the OPEs of the currents, and either you find that or you, you find that with some value of kappa, either it's zero or not. <laughs> uh, the, I feel like this thing kind of looks like yeah, kind of looks like an anomaly, except in an anomaly, good, good, thank you for the question, in an anomaly, the divergence of the current, the, the right-hand side is non-zero, but it's proportional to the unit operator. Here we have a non-trivial operator. Right, so what you would call a Tuft anomaly is divergence of the current in some, at some coincident points has a piece that's proportional to the unit operator. So could we obtain such uh, two groups emitted by the gauge anomaly? So gauge and subgroup of anomaly? Well, I think Thomas told you how to get some two group examples with U1 gauge theories. Yes, yes, yeah. but uh, generally it works. Generally that also so works. Yeah, so it just, the anomaly just corresponds to the three cycle mentioned here. Yeah. 
Well, gauging is not such an innocent operation for a continuous symmetry, for discrete symmetry, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's usually also an action of the zero form on the one form part in a two group. It, yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. In, in, a, in the continuous case, this is not possible because everything is connected to the, if it's a connected Lie group, because everything's connected to the identity, so there can't be any non trivial permutation rep representation. But that, of course, can happen in the discrete case. OK. All right. So um, coming back over here, we're going to consider a scenario. Uh, G being emergent along an RG flow. So we'll have some UV effective field theory. And here, there's no G, no two-group symmetry. And there's going to be some kind of flow. And here we'll have our IR EFT. And here we will have G. And I'll be interested in the case where kappa is not 0. And we're going to try to use this. This is something you could compute something you might be given, an infrared effective field theory with, with this symmetry. And we're going to use this to try and get some interesting constraints on this pattern uh, of what can be in the UV. My last question? When you say that we don't have G, but we still have two separate symmetries. So just no, 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 no. I, I, I mean that some pieces of G will be broken. So I'll, it'll become sharp in a moment, yeah. More gentle this time. OK, so to your first question, kappa being quantized, means it cannot run. Okay, so it's not like the way this is going to happen is that kappa is non-zero here and kappa is going to be zero here. That's not going to happen. Okay. Instead, uh, what's going to happen is that the various pieces of this two-group symmetry are going to be broken in the UV. The one-form symmetry is going to be broken. Maybe the zero-form symmetry is going to be broken. So if I say that at long distances in the IR, I have this two-group two group symmetry, it means that both G0 and this U1, 1 must emerge. By that, I just mean for now that these must individually, the currents for these must individually be present in the infrared. And our question is about what's possible for them in the UV. So let's define some energy scales of emergence. And sir, are you already implying that they are both broken? In the not necessarily. No, no, not, not, not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. We're going to try to discover what the allowed patterns are. Energy scales, OK, of emergence. I'll first be a little bit intuitive, and then I'll try to make a sharper statement. OK? So let's talk about the emergence of the zero form symmetry will be characterized by some scale E0. So when you're below E0, you think that G0 is a good symmetry. When you're above, it looks broken. And this one, E1. Now, we go back over here, and we say that, see that if G0 is present, this is an argument. So if that's a good symmetry, 
That means I'm below the energy scale E0. That's what it means to say that in this kind of picture. E0 could be the UV scale. We don't know yet. But if G0 is present, the zero form symmetry is present, and kappa is not zero, that implies that the U1 one form symmetry is present. Okay, so that's the key observation. That follows just from what's on these boards here. Because the zero form symmetry is not a subgroup. It is a quotient. So let that sink in for a moment. What it implies for you is a universal inequality. E0 is less than or equal to E1. If you reach the energy scale E0, you must already have the one form symmetry present in order for the algebra to be consistent. Yeah, please is just interrupt me. Don't, don't be so polite. OK, is it possible that there is a subgroup of P0 such that this K is 0 when restricted to that subgroup? And then you have like probably three energy scales. Yes, absolutely. That scenario is possible. Uh, people have even written papers about that. Um, yeah, so you can consider, that's an interesting question to try and understand, like, are there sub two groups inside a big two group for which kappa trivializes? And then you could try to study RG flows and what you learn about symmetry enrichment and breaking in there. I'm going to focus on the simplest case, but that absolutely can happen. More questions about this? Seems very trivial. OK. Um, Maybe I should make a comment. Um, you know, you might ask, is this really a theorem? These E's uh, seem only approximately defined, right? This is an energy scale in an RG flow. And I'm saying that E0, below E0, you have G, the zero form symmetry. Above it, you don't. Clearly, there's some going to be some degree of accuracy of that statement. So what's the more precise statement? EI is only approximate. Um, so what to say about that? Uh, the more precise statement is about a family of flows. Um, and you cannot achieve a parametric separation. E0 getting asymptotically bigger than E1 in any flows. So that's kind of related to the answer that someone asked about approximate symmetry before. It's the same kind of, kind of statement here. So this is the more precise uh, thing, but it, it, it will be most useful to think of it intuitively in this guise. And we'll see, we'll see examples of that as we go. OK. Um, I'm reaching the point where I should take questions because I'm about to dive into a long, complicated example, sequence of examples. So, yeah. Can you understand this from the kind of uh, domain wall perspective? Because it seems kind of, if I'm just thinking about having defects, like why I can't have like one emerge than the other and at some other point like that junction that gives these three groups, two group structure? Well, in that picture of symmetry defects that I wrote down, um, I saw, we saw that three uh, co-dimension one defects, if kappa is non-zero, produce this co-dimension two defect. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, they, they, if the co-dimension co one defects are topological, so will the one form symmetry defect be topological. That's the, the version of the argument, but played out for symmetry defects. Any more questions? 
Yeah. And how do you know that this uh, contact term or uh, algebra property is universal? But I mean, it could be removed by some memorization. <coughs> and, uh, so this is do oh, do you, have a, do you have a kind of universal uh, statement about it? You mean whether I can remove this by counter term? Yes. Yeah, good question. The reason you, you, you can't is because this is operator valued. So it, it, they're kind of counter term. You have, to, you have to think about it. You have to write down, uh, you, you have to write down possible um, terms in the action and investigate it. But indeed, you cannot. And it's very restricted because, precisely because it's operator valued. Mm -hmm. okay. Oops, sir. Uh, are there some examples of QFTs where I can just study OPEs like explicitly? Uh, study, study an OPE of JMU, JNU and see if that JMU will appear? Sure, yeah. I, well, I thought that Thomas talked about the U1 gauge theory example. That's one where you can do it. Yeah. Maybe he didn't talk about current algebra, though. Um, OK, so I have to fetch this. Yeah, please. So this equation is sort of, it's an OP, right? So it's sort of sensitive to the UP because it puts the terms together. Uh, that the symmetry might not be present with the UP, so there's a bit of an ambiguity there, right? So for example, in the QED example, it's not UP complete, so the OP is a little ambiguous. Mm. Well, you're worried about the Landau pole? Hmm. Um, hmm. I don't think we should be worried. I mean, I, th I think that's kind of like saying that, you know, QED can't have any non-abelian symmetry because it's also s it, uh, it also shows up in the in the OPE. But I think as an effective field theory, it can. Okay. Let's do some examples. OK, so we'll, we'll get back into this uh, QED example, but now um, with the guise of the emergence theorem. OK, so the example is U1 gauge theory. Always four space-time dimensions for me today. And n massless fermions, massless Dirac fermions. We write them in vial notation, like civilized people. They're chi plus and minus. But do I want to give a name to this index? I guess I'll call it A, maybe. A goes from 1 to n. OK, so make a little table. So chi plus and chi minus are vial fermions. What are their charges under the groups that we care about? There's U1G. There's uh, an SUN, which we could call left and right. So this has charge plus 1. This has charge minus 1. This is a fundamental and trivial here. This is trivial here and a fundamental. Say. Now, there's a non trivial triangle diagram. Let's put S U N. L here, S U N L here. So those are insertions of currents, of operators. And this is the photon field. If we think of it as an operator, this is the insertion of J mu nu, the one form symmetry magnetic current. So someone asked me, are there examples where you can go and compute that three point function and find this term? Here I'm doing it for you. This triangle is computing that three point function. So what you find from this is that kappa L equals plus 1 and kappa R equals minus 1.
So we have a non-trivial two group, um, actually kind of two non-trivial two groups here. Um, So it's the, it, what is it involving here? It's the U1 one form magnetic symmetry. The electric symmetry is broken because we have charged matter fields of charge one in this problem. The magnetic symmetry is not because we don't have any dynamical monopoles. So we still have this one form symmetry. Because, okay. And uh, these S, U, N, L, or R zero form symmetries. If I write it in the extension way, I have this. Now let's make a little note. Yes. Each one, or you mean tensor product of L and R? I mean each one. Okay. Yeah. So so right. So yeah. There's a two group U one. Boldface G S U N L, and there's another one U1 boldface G S U N R. We're actually going to try and disentangle what's going on with various combinations. Okay, so to that end, let's note that the diagonal S U N delta, the diagonal inside the product S U N L times S U N R has kappa equal kappa left plus kappa right equals 0. So there's one combination here that is not in a non-trivial two group. Any questions? Yeah. The electric U1 is gone. I mean, you should, you, you should check me, if you like, that this, uh, this three-point function really is computing for the magnetic U1. That's something about the way the indices work out, that you know, uh, you know, where the epsilon goes. Right? The, remember that the magnetic current, if I think of it as a current, is epsilon f. And you know that this kind of diagram should have an epsilon tensor in it. So that's why it's the magnetic one. So there is actually only one two group. Uh, you want this uh, axial? There's only one two group. There are, there are these two structure constants. It's you, you could, yeah. You could think that it's with the axial one if you like. Yeah, and this axial one it will be uh, k equals two. Uh, yeah. What time did I start, by the way? I think ten minutes, ten minutes late. Okay. All right. So we're coming up on an hour. Uh, great. OK. So we'd like to view this theory as our IR effective field theory and try to constrain various uh, UB completions. Before we go this, can I ask a elementary question about yeah. this theory? So, in this theory, usually we do say that axial theory, axial symmetry restricts some, I mean, needs some restrictions on the For example, that the, the Fermi mass term is not generated. Yes, that's the axial U1 symmetry, which I didn't even write up but here. Now you said axial U1 by itself is not a symmetry. No, 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 I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Actually, you know, tomorrow I'll give you a lecture about how the axial symmetry is actually non-invertible. Okay. Uh, right. So the axial symmetry, you shouldn't forget it. It's still there. But that's a more advanced topic to understand okay. the axial symmetry very well. OK, view is an IR EFT. And we're going to constrain using this emergence theorem. So. Question. Practically, low tech people here, how do we break U1 
u1, 1, m. So I said you need dynamical monopoles. That sounds very fancy, as if we know how to couple in dynamical monopoles in some simple way. How do you actually do it in practice? Well, the answer is that you embed, if you want to stay in the world of kind of weakly coupled theories that you can get your hands on and talk about in a lecture, we're going to embed u1g inside a non-abelian uv group. So for instance, we could talk about an SU2 gauge group with phi. This could be an adjoint scalar. And if the expectation value of trace phi squared is not 0, this will trigger a Higgs mechanism RG that will get us back down to u1. OK. So this is a very, now of course, famously that model does have dynamical monopoles. Right? The, that's the George I. Glashow model. It has the dynamical monopoles. So it is breaking the symmetry by the mechanism that I advertised. But it's also easy to see it at a more practical level because once the u1 is thought of as the carton of SU2, well, then it's clear that the, the Bianchi identity for the u1 doesn't hold. Some SU2 Bianchi identity holds, but not the u1. OK, so in this flow, what is E1? What is the scale at which this one form symmetry emerges? Shout it out if you know. Yeah, it's the Higgsing scale. So E1, so trace of phi squared is like E1 squared. So E1 is the Higgsing scale. That same way is the monopole scale? Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, there's, there's actually a, sharp, a sharper answer to your question. Uh, maybe I should give it. The, um, the argument about having monopoles be dynamical, breaking the symmetry, what that really says is that the symmetry must be broken already by the time you reach that scale. It does not say that that's the lowest possible scale. I see. Right? So you have to compare. Is the Higgsing scale? lower or uh, higher than the monopole mass scale. That depends on the coupling, actually. So the monopole scale is larger than the Higgsing scale? Uh, the, if, if g is small, yeah. Yeah, if g is small, the monopole mass is like v, is, is like v over g. So that's a bigger scale. Has to be that way? No. I think you can have, you, you can have, if you were trying to do this uh, in, strong, in the strong coupling limit, then the monopole would be the dominant effect. So I'm, I'm one, I want to work in the weak coupling universe for, for these lectures, though. OK, um, good. So what, what is the implication of this uh, emergence theorem? In this kind of example, what can we conclude? OK. 
Okay. So in any UV, in particular this one that we're talking about here, this SU2, which we'll investigate momentarily, where U1G goes inside a non-abelian gauge group, Individually, SUNL and SUNR are broken by the Higgsing scale. That's the inequality in action. Now, I can say this about SUN left and SUN right because they have non-trivial kappa. But this diagonal does not. So I should add a further comment that the diagonal SUN delta need not be broken. That's a model independent question of whether the diagonal one is broken. A model dependent question, excuse me. OK, so now we go back to our SU2. OK, let's see. Let's see it in practice. I, I gave you really the simplest example. This conclusion is general, but I want to show it to you in this example. So if we have UV SU2G, what do we have to do? We have to put chi, chi plus and chi minus, these fermions, are in representations of U1. We have to put them into representations of SU2. Okay. There might seem to be options for that. Let's try the simplest option. We're just trying to illustrate the theorem right now. So the simplest option is that these chi's go into a doublet. So we have a doublet. And of course, under this Higgsing, this will become chi plus and minus. So the question we should ask ourselves, in this model, SU2G with these doublets, n doublets, to reproduce our n fermions, what's the flavor symmetry? So you must rotate full doublets. Right? That's the point. Kind of an obvious point. In, in the infrared, you can rotate chi plus, and you can leave chi minus alone, and you can rotate chi minus and leave chi plus alone. Once you put them into doublets, that's illegal. You have to rotate only full doublets. Okay, so if we look at our, our, our doublets here, so I can rotate full doublets. And what is that symmetry? I have no other flavor symmetry. I can rotate only full doublets. But this is my SUN diagonal. So in this model, we could include interactions to violate SUN delta, but we need not, just by the multiplet pattern. And this is consistent with the theorem that we saw up there. There isn't any symmetry of this UV that can rotate the individual components of the doublet, but there is a symmetry that rotates the full doublets, and that's the one that doesn't participate in the two group. Questions? So this is, of course, if you have a correct argument, it should work in every example. But it's fun to see it in an example. Yeah. But we would expect the symmetry to emerge exactly at the Higgsing scale, right? Um, you mean uh, about this parametrics, yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's if you if you want to talk about uh, talk about a rigorous statement, you need to talk about the parametrics. Okay. And uh, now, if I would say, I, I know you said you want to stay in recoupling, but to make my coupling big, and then the monopole mass would be move lower than big squared. Yeah. Um, if if I want to do that, um, I'll have to be careful about having technical control over this. Yeah. 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 So that, that, that is actually the reason why I wanted to stay at weak coupling is so that I can say, like, I completely understand this RG flow and it's going to give an illustration. So for large enough G, we just cannot say anything anymore. Yeah. I mean, the theorem is about, is, is theorem with current algebra, so the theorem is still true. Yeah. It's just harder to extract, like, what's the consequence I in, in that case. Okay. Is there some setup where this uh, SUN left cross SUN right could be broken by instantons in the... Uh, the like instant answer. Yeah, of the non-abelian. There isn't really a, you're asking for like a mixed ABJ type anomaly with non-abelian gauge fields. I don't know if that exists in 4D. I don't know an example like that. So if you're starting with a non-abelian gauge symmetry in the UB, in a sense, you don't need to know about the two-group symmetry, and you can just work out example by example, just as in this example, to, to derive the consequence. Right? So, so I, I wonder, yeah, okay, maybe your point is it's very universal, or maybe there are different ways, more fancy ways of breaking the one-form symmetry. The, 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 point here, the, the point here was that um, you can, like, the, the reason I, I think this is an interesting statement is that it's some reasoning that you can get just from the infrared. Imagine, imagine you're a model builder, right? This is maybe about particle physics. You, you think of the standard model as an effective field theory, and you want to know what possible UV completions there are. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a kind of constraint that you can put on them. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, and we'll actually do this in the afternoon, I think. Uh, you can say, well, maybe I want, uh, I want something to happen with the hypercharge gauge field. And then I'll be able to make some general conclusions about what can happen in the UV. So of course, example by example, from the top down, there's nothing mysterious about this, right? Like this is a weakly coupled Higgsing RG flow. So from that point of view, it's just what you see is what you get. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so in the last part of this uh, lecture before lunch, I'd like to ask. I'd like to tell you about. Some small refinements. 20 minutes, perfect. Uh, so let's try and generalize. To an approximate. IR G0. So we're going to say that in the infrared, G0 is broken by some coupling. Y, which we'll think of as small. So when Y goes to 0, G0 is restored. Yes. You can set up as a SO3 Georgie Blash album. I'm assuming there's a Z2 version of the two group that stays because it's a Z2 one from symmetry. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, you're asking about how the SO3 case works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Any more questions about this stuff? Okay, um, good. So, uh, so we're going to be in this situation. The infrared has, uh, has uh, an approximate two group symmetry now. So the G0 is broken by a small parameter. That's a very physical situation to be in. Um, and we'd like to understand, is there any consequence? Right? How do we, how do we uh, think about this? Okay. So we're going to consider a family of RG flows. Okay, so we'll have some UV theory that we think of as depending on Y. Our RG, 
our IR theory. It depends on y. In this, I want u1, 1 to be broken. Here, I want u1, 1 to be preserved. But uh, g0 broken by y. Um, it could be, uh, it, yeah, usually it would be a relevant operator breaking the symmetry. It doesn't, isn't broken in the UV? It's broken in the UV as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bro it's broken in both, sorry. Um, well, I don't want to say broken by Y, but it, it, definitely this flow doesn't have G0 symmetry because it doesn't even have it at long distances. Yeah. Okay, so as our assumption is that as y goes to 0, g0 is restored in the infrared, and kappa is non-zero. Well, let me not even write that. Um, now, in this situation, so as y0 goes to 0 and, and g0 is restored in the IR, this means that at, in this limit, the emergence theorem holds. And our question is, what can we say about that limit in the UV? So if I set y to 0 in the UV theory, can the UV theory have the zero form symmetry or not? That's what we're trying to understand here. Okay. Now, we'll need to track two kinds of matter. Why not equal to zero states come in two types. Massless particles. in TIR of Y. And let's say they contribute kappa naught. We can assume that, for instance, this is non-zero to make the question interesting. So there are this, the particles in the infrared theory which are massless for all Y. Those are the ones that you have a good control over. And now we also need to watch out for massive particles. with masses suppressed by y. So mass is like y alpha i m i for alpha i greater than 0. That doesn't go up anymore. So when y goes to 0, these contribute something to kappa in general. Some mass scale. Um, well, this RG flow is very general, so whatever mass scales are in this flow. The, the only thing you're supposed to take away from this is that the, these particles have the feature that they become massless when y goes to 0. That's what I'm trying to isolate about them. So what's the total structure constant?
for y going to 0. It's the sum of the two. It's kappa naught plus this sum over i of kappa i. So it's the kappa naught is like the naive infrared contribution, right? It's the part that you see from the massless particles, which are massless even when y equals 0, or the light particles, if we were thinking maybe more approximately. And then there's some part that it comes from particles that come down when we restore the symmetry. And so there's this total kappa. Okay? So this we'll call kappa. Each individual contribution is quantized, yeah. So along RG flow only the total one is not changed? In, in, in this case, the, the, reason, the, the reason you can, ha uh, you can have this, uh, this jump is because the G0 symmetry is only approximate, yeah. What, 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 the, the way to do the reasoning is to try to set up the question at y equals 0, which is what I'm trying to do. So at y equals 0, you really have the two-group symmetry. The structure constant is really quantized. Each particle species gives you a definite integer contribution. OK, so the total structure constant for y equals 0 is this kappa. And now uh, this emergence theorem. Tells you what? It tells you something. about the UV theory. This limit, as y goes to 0, can it restore the zero form symmetry or not? Can it also have the zero form symmetry? Well, we know what the answer is. It can have g0 if kappa total, that kappa, equals 0. Only if. How should you think about this intuitively? Get a handle on this kind of statement. So put yourself in the, sh in the shoes of an infrared person. The infrared person sees this TIR with this weakly broken G0 symmetry and some light particles, some massless particles, I should say, contributing kappa naught. And they want to know, is it possible for there to be a UV that also has weakly broken G naught symmetry by the same y. Okay? And the answer is yes, provided that that parameter y controls the masses of additional particles needed to cancel out the total kappa. Okay? So intuitively, the same parameter that's really the key thing controlling g not breaking in the UV <coughs> controls the masses of new states. I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't see the contradiction if you don't have k equal zero. Sorry, l let me say it again. So, so, okay. So, if y equals zero, the infrared has uh, has two group symmetry with some kappa. Okay. So, I if that kappa is non-zero, then the UV cannot have uh, the UV cannot have the zero form symmetry. That's what the emergence theorem says. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a mouthful, but let's again go back to our example, um, which is fortuitously still mostly on the board. Um, yes, I, I, I'm I'm doing some kind of like weak coupling type analysis. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to our example.
Okay. Let's include in L I R a term like this. Y times some M chi plus A chi minus A. So this breaks the individual S, U, N, L, and R symmetries, right, this Y parameter. But you can't separately rotate chi plus and chi minus now. You can only rotate them in a coordinate way, a coordinated way. And of course, this symmetry is restored as y goes to 0. So we like to think again about UB completions of this kind of model. And there's a, uh, let's keep, stick to this SU2 gauge theory framework. But there's a new UV completion possible. So you, you, could, you, you could again try to put uh, chi plus and chi minus into a doublet. Nothing surprising will happen there. Nothing, uh, nothing that sort of makes use of this loophole, this idea that massive states can come down with the same parameter. Let's find a UV completion that makes use of it. Okay. So let me call rho A to be a doublet that contains chi plus and somebody else, psi minus. And say eta A contains psi plus. Here I'm thinking of an SU2 doublet, thinking of it under U1, so you see the different charges. And chi minus. Okay. So under SU2, these are both doublets. <coughs> and under SUN, I'll have them transform, I think, this way. Now I need to tell you how to get from that UV model to uh, this one here, the same U1 model, but now with this, you, the, this mass term. E easy enough. So we need a Yukawa term in the UV. So LUV will include what kind of term? Y, I guess I called my triplet phi. Let's give phi the indices now. So we see these are triplet indices, or doublet indices rather. And then we have rho A mu eta nu a, that kind of thing. So mu and nu are doublet indices. A is this flavor index that we were talking about before. So now phi becomes some vev, some scale, times this matrix. That breaks SU2G to U1G. Okay. And this term here, what happens to it under this RG flow, under this reduction? It becomes Y times lambda. Now, you see from this off diagonal pairing here and the structure that I'll get a term where chi plus pairs with chi minus and a term where psi plus pairs with psi minus. OK. 
Okay. What happens as y goes to 0? Both the UV and the infrared have enhanced flavor symmetry. So if we make a little table, lots of tables in this, these lectures. I'm supposed to stop momentarily. That will work perfectly. OK, so 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, box, 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 box. Now the SUN L and SUN R kappas vanish. And you see that this UV, when you set y to 0, does separately have the SUN times SUN flavor symmetry. You can rotate rho and eta independently. The price I pay is that to achieve that, I have to introduce new matter whose mass is suppressed by the same y, the same parameter that controls the G0 breaking. So the new matter, which in this case are the psi plus and minus, have mass suppressed by y. That's, That's as, as an IR observer, you would never, you would have to also find these particles, right? The way it is now. Yeah, so, so imagine, imagine you're an IR observer and you have a, par a very good approximate flavor symmetry. That's actually true in the standard model. Some of the flavor symmetries are, are very good. And it would, we'll be able to constrain UVs. We would say that you know, the mass of these new particles was not lambda, but y times lambda. So that's far below the Higgsing scale. That, that's the interesting conclusion. Can you talk about the power? Can you constrain the power of y? For example, y can be y point power 0.01, for example. It's consistent with the argument itself. It's kind of unnatural. But I wonder if you can exclude that. Um, that's a good question. Um, maybe let's talk about it during the break. I, I want to actually, I'm, I'm done with what I wanted to say for the first lecture. So uh, if people are hungry, we can go to lunch and have some discussion. Yeah.